Uh, this is our third presentation, the speaker series in the spring semester for the data science and analytics program at Buffalo State. Uh, we have two presenters tonight that work together in a project and this project is open for to students. So uh, if you are interested, and I hope you are, uh, students, you will be able to, to join uh, Patrick and Dave in, uh, in their uh, research in data science in this project. And uh, they would count as part of your professional lab, or if it's more extensive, even an internship. Now, Patrick Ravins has been director and associate professor in the Patricia H. and Richard E. Gartman Art Conservation Department at our institution since 2010. Before that, he was a senior project conservator and research fellow from 2007 to 2010 at the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York. He was an Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in the Advanced Residency Program in Photograph Conservation from 2005 to 7 at the Eastman Museum and from 86 to 2005 in the Conservation Office in Baha'i World Center, Haifa, Israel. His research interests are in the material science of 19th century photographic systems, natural water soluble, soluble polymers and surface metrology applied to cultural heritage. Our second speaker that working together is uh, Dave uh, Sheets. Uh, he has a wide range of research interests, all based on the study of dynamical processes from a mathematical and statistic perspective. This has included the study of the growth of diversification of biological organisms, such as long-term change with lineages, as well as large-scale patterns of biodiversity changes, particularly mass extinctions. Some of this work has also led to an involvement with forensics, where Dr. Sheets has been a strong critic and a forensic bite mark, mark analysis and has served on a national level scientific panel charge with establishing best practices in forensic handwriting analysis. So we are uh, very pleased to have you here. Please, uh, Patrick, I think you're the first speaker. Go ahead, please. Uh, Joaquin, thank you very much for the introduction. And Heather, thank you for all the work that you do on, in the back end. It's really a pleasure to be able to talk to you all about surface metrology, my area, and David will tell you all about data science and analytics as we apply it to Asian lacquers, modern Asian lacquer surfaces. Both David and I are pretty excited about what we've been doing, but that happens to be the case when you're doing your own research. But we hope to uh, contagion you, infect you with some of this excitement over the next few moments. I'd like to share uh, the co-workers beyond this area. Marianne Webb is out in Vancouver, Wash uh, Vancouver Canada. Uh, British Columbia, a specialist in lacquer conservation. Sunwa Kim is one of ours at Buffalo State in the art design department, an expert in Urushi works and furniture design. And Michael Shillin and Haran Khandian are both chemists at the Getty Conservation Institute, and they're doing a lot of the chemical analyses. So we're talking about surfaces, and I just wanted to give you a, a wide range of surfaces and how we uh, take them for granted maybe, but also enjoy them in terms of this high polish mirror finish on a car. This is a good old beamer, if some of you have it, and we're looking at an air solid interface. That's that skin that reflects light quite nicely. And in the outside, this car would shine if the sun were shining. The other aspect I wanna bring forth is water as a surface, another the air liquid. And so that is another interesting surface. And this little insect just has the ability to walk on water. Interestingly enough, at these surface interfaces, we have quite a few chemical, physical processes, and I guess you can call heat transfer happening, as well as gas diffusing into the water, gas diffusing out. So the surfaces at all these different interfaces mean quite a bit. One that we have a lot of, and we do take care quite a bit of care of, is our own skin, a very specialized surface keeping us inside and having all the features that we also appreciate. We can get cold, we can get sunburn, we can get you know frostbite on the outside and all these other aspects. And then another higher level magnification image to show how interesting our skin looks when you really look at it at you know 
2,000, 3,000 magnification. After this, you probably won't see your skin the same way as you did two minutes ago. So from here, we jump over to cultural heritage, art, and the surfaces that we find there as well. Those would be more air uh, solid interfaces. And in this particular case, you have Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci about 600 years ago. And interesting enough, <clears throat> we see cracks. That's surface deformation. And we don't like that, but in some cases, 600 years old, a few cracks would probably be considered beauty wrinkles if you want, but we want to find out more about them. And by measuring the surface, we be, may be able to see whether they're growing or not. In the particular case of lacquer, this is a Japanese lacquer piece, it has very nice surface, very nice gloss, but with time, these things also deteriorate. Here we have an older piece, and the image on the background is what's happened to the surface very correct, and we would expect that this would have been one unified surface in the past, such as in the next example of this modern piece of only 12 years ago by Aoki Chie, where you see huge piece of lacquer, which is unusual. This is roughly six feet by four feet by three feet in dimensions, high gloss. It just has a beautiful surface, and that's part of the object's aesthetic. <clears throat> so the object and the surface really kind of work together to give that visual impact. So what are we going to look at now? We've been part of this experiment, uh, and there's three parts of it. We've done the first two where we've looked at new surfaces. The chemistry has been done elsewhere. We've been doing the physical tests, accelerated aging uh, tests of the surfaces, and we've redone the physical test, the surface metrology. And the next part will come probably in another year or two where we perform treatments and we then we measure them. So these are the couple topics that I want to talk about is the materials and processes of the lacquer and then surface metrology, our experiments and the data that we've been able to extract. And then David will take it farther with more uh, data. Uh, data analysis, that is. Uh, so we have three different types of lacquers. We have the Urushio from Japan and China, Lacco, Tizio. They all vary by this carbon chain, 15 to 17 to 17, and in this case, separate position. Now, these come from poison, poison ivy-like plants. Once it's dried and cured, you don't have to worry about it, but when it's a sap, it's very dangerous, and you'll have a rash all over. So in addition to having three different lacquers from three different plant biological sources, we have many different types of historical lacquer mixtures and, or formulations that have been used. Basically what we have is a lacquer thitsio ruscio component, any from 10 to 20%, but then the rest is drying oils, glue, starches, carbohydrates, oils, in this case, cedar oil and tannins that make up the, this lacquer that you've seen in previous slides and you'll see some more of. So how is this applied? We have wooden panels, polished, highly polished. These are uh, plywoods. First coating is put on. They're put in special chambers so that uh, with high humidity so that the enzyme process of hardening and drying takes place quickly. More lacquer is put on, sanded, this is the second step or the third step before the final step. You end up having quite a range of prepared samples. And then the final step has the final coat. And so we have urushiols on the outside of all of these. We have lacols going on here, five of each of those. And then in Tizio, we've got four. This fellow just didn't make it. Marianne Webb prepared these two batches, the lacols and the Tizios. Sumar prepared the Urushios, and that's her area of expertise. And if you have a chance to go to her website to look at her stuff, I recommend it. Really beautiful stuff. Okay, a brief introduction to surface metrology and what we've done with the lacquers. So basically, we're measuring the surfaces. We're looking at that air solid interface, and we're able to extract information from that. Uh, that could be referred to as either surface geometry, texture, or roughness. They're used interchangeably. And the fourth term you may find is uh, topography. What we can do is deconstruct a surface into form, which is the largest deviation, waviness 
intermediate, and then roughness, the finest deviations or the finest texture, if you may. If you may. We've been able to measure these using a confocal microscope. And the, I think the value of this particular instrument is that even with a 10x objective, we're able to get a resolution in the Z direction of roughly 20 nanometers, meaning that if you've got features of 100 nanometers or greater, five to 10 times greater than this resolution, they should be quite definable and re resolvable. Interestingly enough, the lateral or the XY resolution is two orders of magnitude at three micrometers greater than this one over here. <clears throat> so we're able to see fine detail in the Z, and that is what we're able to exploit later on. So the objective will start at one spot, move its way up in many different stages, as you see here. And at each stage, the confocal principle is such that it only captures what's in focus. The remainder, such as this black area here, is out of focus, it's excluded. So you can catch this image stack, which could be either hundreds or thousands. And once you've caught that group, you can then put it into software and generate good um, information uh, and start analyzing the data. And from that, we're able to get roughly about a million data points of good height difference or just heights all over the place. Now, I know that for data scientists, a million is, you know, small amounts. But if you start <laughs> from a chemist's point of view and you start looking at maybe one point or two points or a spectrum, then you realize, goodness gracious, it depends what you're looking at or where you're coming from to be able to see what you've got. Anyway, we have a good amount of data. Now, from the mechanical engineering point of view, the ISO has a large number of sur surface texture uh, ways to deal with the data. And one of the ones that we're gonna work on today are the height parameters. And of these height parameters, we're gonna be focusing on the root mean square height or the root mean square of Z, S sub Q. Basically, you all will probably, you know, start enjoying seeing equations like this, you know, your double integrals and so on and so forth. But anyway, so that's what we're gonna be looking at. And this is useful to a certain degree. So we, we put the lacquer plate on the plate, on the uh, X, X, Y, table here, we center it with respect to the objective. So that's our first point or our zero position. And that little green is what we're measuring. Uh, the next thing is we took all the plates that we have, the 14 plates, and we identified these positions and we were doing all the measurements and we separated them into four areas because later on they did the aging and I'll show you what we have, what happens later on with that. So let me just take you through what we did with one sample of transparent lacquer that we're gonna go through position one. We are using the mountains map software by Digital Surf, that's all canned. And basically after you run the data or after you run a sample, you end up getting an identity card which deals with the X, Y, Z components, but also with the image uh, or intensity layer, which is your black and white photograph. <clears throat> we refer that to, uh, we were referring to this as our metadata. So this is the data all combined in one. The software allows us to extract both the X, Y, Z component from the black and white image. I want you to take a good look at all these little black little dots because we'll come back to them in about 10, 15 slides. <clears throat> so once we have this separated, we can actually start looking at this information. <clears throat> what we need to do is we notice that there's a slope going from height, the highest point here, all the way down here. That's, this data is showing that there is some type of slope or gradient, and we need to get rid of that. So we level the data and it appears as such. We see a wave or component, a dip, and then we see a very tiny, fine structure, that's our roughness. Once we have this data using the ISO height, um, surface metrology height standards or height parameters, we're able to extract and condense that. In other words, reduce it to one number, that height parameter. So it's really kind of interesting to see how uh, almost a million points can be squeezed down into one number. So we can use that and we can also use, uh, filter the data 
to be able to separate the wider components of the waviness from the roughness. And by using a robust Gaussian filter, it allows us to do that. And we're using roughly with this 10x objective, we're using about 10% of the overall distance from here to here, which is 1.6 millimeters. We're using a 10th, which is 16, 0.16 millimeters. And that allows us to separate a good amount of the roughness from the waviness. That's a rule of thumb that's used in mechanical engineering. Once we have these two, we can also calculate the root mean square uh, height waviness as well as the roughness, and we can start tabulating all of these for all the different Lacol plates. So we have a Lacol plate, just transparent Lacol. We have Lacol with perilla oil. We have Lacol, which is a black Lacol with the perilla oil, Lacol with cinnabar and the perilla oil, and then we have black Lacol with the perilla oil as well as, well as cedar oil all variations on the theme of LACOL. So by looking at the root mean square height deviation for the levels, all the blues are the entire set of data, all the oranges are your waviness, and all of the green is the roughness. Basically, the application of the oil to the LACOL hasn't changed the waviness much, has changed the roughness a little bit, as well as the overall uh, surface topography. When you look at cinnabar, it seems like it was ground pretty well, but there's not much difference between these and the original Lycol. This is a little lower, the waviness is a little lower. And these two over here are black Lycols, and they have an overall decrease or drop in this root mean square height value. So it helps to kind of categorize these a bit, and that's as far as we can go with this one. We did it with the Thitsiols as well. In this case, we only had four. So we have the, the Thitsiol by itself. We have Thitsiol with tongue oil. You have Thitsiol with cinnabar. This, sorry, with cinnabars here. And with the wood oil, it's right here. Interestingly enough, all the wavinesses are much greater and the roughness is much lower. In conversation with Marianne Webb, who prepared this set of plates, she said that this material was much more viscous to work with. So all the waviness could be related to how she applied it, and you're seeing the artist craftsman workmanship show up in the waviness. But in general, your roughness, which is more the material itself, is showing much lower degrees of roughness compared to the lacol, and these tend to be a bit glossier to the eye as well. Urushios, these were prepared by Sun Hua Kim, and these are the, re are the results. This is plain Urushio. Again, the waviness is much lower, roughness is much higher. You put oil, it decreases everything. And that's the first time we've observed this. You have the black Urushio, also quite low, very similar to the, just the oil. And when you have cinnabar, it jumps way out. It's uh, almost double everything else. And interestingly enough, in discussions with uh, Marianne, she said, you know, it's very likely that the cinnabar, which is a the colorant in powder form, was mixed in but was not ground enough to be able to reduce it. And so this is one of the differences between people who applied it with people who, different people applying and making it. This particular one is quite interesting. It's just uh, Urushio, black Urushio, but every step of the way, the piece has been polished to a high degree. And so you can see the manual labor does pay off and you, much, you get a much uh, lower overall surface uh, roughness, waviness, and the overall topography is much less. So throwing them all together into one graph makes your eyes dance a bit, but I think it's instructive to see the relative proportion of how Lacol to Thitsiol are very similar in terms of the overall range of values, whereas the Ruchiol on its own, but also with the Cinnabar, is way out. In other words, much larger numbers for the root mean square values. Okay. So I wanted to bring you back to this one. We were looking at roughness in the previous uh, set of uh, images and, and data. And I just wanted to bring that all these little black spots are pits. With the software, we were able to look at peaks and pits. And interestingly enough, when you look at just the lacol plate, we find that 
the red ones are all the peaks and they're much higher by about 20 to 30 percent than the peaks. Pits are interesting in that they could be seen as small reaction vessels on any surface, but especially on lacos, and you'll see some of that later in the aged pieces. So let's take a look at the aged ones. So what happened was we had this whole piece was unaged. We then took it and it, area four was aged for 50 hours of light and then eight weeks of relative humidity for 80 and 20%, 80% one week, 20% the next week, and then on for another six weeks alternating that way. So it's cycled. Area three was done for 100 hours, then uh, cycled again. This area two, 150 hours, and area one, 200 hours. Somehow, either I or they, we just kind of flipped our number. So four is least aged, one is most aged. <clears throat> and let's take a look at the images. This is the image I wanted you to remember. If you start looking at the area four, it looks like something has happened in this area, a little more intensity. And if you remember some of the data, the roughness had increased in these. In area three, we start seeing the beginning of cracks and the beginning of cracks is associated with some of those pits. In some cases, you have a pit right in the middle and it radiates outward and here as well. Area two, aged for 150 hours, you see, uh, and this is the light, you see much more crack uh, cracking, cracular, and uh, with area one the same, perhaps a little more than in this one. <clears throat> so there's a progression from beginning or incipient here to beginning and then to just total, in a sense, uh, cracular developing. <clears throat> this is just another way to look at it. Here you can actually see the ridges as being above the overall surface and here as well. Okay, so this is like all the unaged versus the aged, four, three, two, one. And there's, I can't see any patterns here. If you guys can, I really like it. It seems like it, we go with the roughness, we go high, low, eh, almost the same here. And then with the area two, it increases and then increases again. Let's throw the Lacol, Fitziol, and Urushiol together, just for comparison. Lacols, we still can't figure anything out here, but with Fitziol, what I found interesting is that the roughness increases. This is unaged, aged for the least aging increases, next aging higher, and then it plateaus in the last two. So there's a you know, monotonic increase there. With Urushiol, we have the reverse happening. We have the unaged, is quite high in its roughness, but then even after 50 hours, there is a noticeable reduction. After another 100 hours of aging with light, further reduction, and then it plateaus at the end at 150 and 200 hours of light. Interesting aspects, so we can get some information based on the root mean square uh, height differences or height variation. And so we are able to then see that all of this data that's been boiled down into one can provide some use, but I find that there's so much data here that we need to find a way to extract more from it to be able to get a better idea of what's happening at the surface, because this is rich data mining opportunity. <clears throat> so with that, I just mentioned that we have looked at silver gelatin photographs and daguerreotypes, it's a metallic surface, and we've had pretty successful looking at that. To end, I just want to say that we can characterize the surface of just about any, any uh, material in the cultural heritage and art world. The other aspect is, if we can do this, we can actually use that object as a, as a, as a sensor of the, where, it, where it lives, be it on display or be it in, in, a, in a storage environment. And this becomes very big in terms of preventive conservation. And then for those of us who like to actually interact with the object itself, we can then use this as a tool for quality assurance, quality control. And I, I thank you very much for your time. This little cute bear is lacquer work. And what you're seeing here is mother of pearl. And you can see all the different shades of it. And this over here is lacquer and you have some clear lacquer over the entire piece. Anyway, thanks. David, it's yours. I hope Patrick has convinced you, has convinced me that, that there's a lot of neat things going on with, with surface textures on art objects. Um, 
So this is really going to be discussing how can we take those images and um, get a little more detailed look at what that roughness looks like. And so some, some thinking about how we can use some, some recent tactics to look at these surfaces. So just the nature of the data. Again, this is uh, one, of, one of the scans. Um, it's a 984 by 984 pixel image. This is a false color image. I'm just looking at them flat. So this is a, uh, a one channel image. So in a way, this is akin to a black and white photograph. So in terms of, of image processing, you think of this as a 984 by 984 by one, because there's only one image layer here, unlike you know, red, green, blue, where you'd have three, three layers to this. Um, the thing to note about this data is relatively costly in this system. This is a costly in terms of Patrick's time, particularly. Um, it's, it's a little hard to come by. So the data sets are not as large as we'd like. There's a lot of data per image, but not, uh, not a lot of separate images. And that's something we have to deal with. Uh, when we start looking at these, there are two sort of basic cleaning issues we have um, at the start of looking at one of these scans. And the first is that tilt. Um, basically, what we do is we fit uh, just a, a simple 2D regression model to this thing, model the underlying tilt, and remove it. So that's just using a regression model. Um, and then we do have missing or drop data. And in this uh, case, we used uh, imputed points. So if we're missing points, we imputed using the nearest neighbors on that image to impute any missing points and let us work with it. Um, we can't really afford to throw out data here. We just don't have enough. So that's sort of the initial processing. And then as a way of thinking about how to carry out classification, because that's probably usually what we're interested in here is fundamentally a classification task. You know, what type of lacquer is this? What happened to it? Those types of questions. There are two sort of ways to think about how to proceed with this data. And one is feature engineering, where we try to extract some features. And really what Patrick showed you in, in, in the world of data science, we think of as some basic feature extraction, you know, where he's got some of these basic parameters that the mechanical engineering tradition has used to talk about these. Um, but we can think about other ways of extracting different types of features or different types of information from the surface. And we'll talk about that. We might think of Fourier transforms. You could take a, a spatial Fourier transform of the surface and use some of the components from that. Um, you can think about using wavelet transforms. Or what we do here is just use a, a Gaussian filter bank. So we just pass the image through a whole series of Gaussian filters of different sizes, and we'll see what that looks like. Uh, then the other thought, another whole different way of approaching this is not to process the image at all, but just to use it as the input into a neural net and just use a convolutional neural network as a way of processing this image data and then feed that directly into a classifier using a neural net system. So um, we've looked at both approaches. I'll show you some prototypes of both of them. So the feature engineering. Um, and so one analysis, one way, an, an analogy here is sandpaper. And if you've ever used sandpaper, you know that it comes in different grits, okay? And so the lower the grit number is, the larger the particulate size and the higher the grit number, the finer the size is. So you buy sandpaper by grit, right? And this really means texture. Um, and so this is a way of thinking about this where you've sorted it out, right, by textural sizes. And 40 grit sandpaper has an average grain size of 425 microns, uh, 400 grit is 23 microns and so on. So that's really a one way of thinking about kind of graininess or size, or uh, I'm gonna be calling it roughness spectrum. Geologists often use this a lot. Um, they look at this by looking at the scale of texture of usually sediment materials, right? So they'll take a whole set of sieves, right? With different size gratings. You can see a really large grating on the right-hand side and a very fine one on the left. And uh, they pour sediment through these materials progressively, right? So you start with the large one, pour through there, extract the large pieces and, and measure that, right? And, and so on. So what you get is for a grain size that the geologists use, for example, is something like this. They've got percentages by mass. So the size of the grains are along the bottom axis and then the mass is along the vertical axis. And so you can talk about sediments from different sources by the mixture of particle sizes. And so this is really the analogy we're using here. What we're gonna do is use a series of Gaussian filters, so mathematical filters rather than physical sieves, but um, that's what we're gonna do to the surface. And then we can measure the magnitude. So this is uh, really sort of starting um, about where the top part where Patrick stopped. You know, if we take a Gaussian filter of size 10 pixels and we feed in uh, this Lacall plate image, you can see on the top, there's the smooth, the low pass portion of this material. And that has got kind of the waviness idea. It's a little, little different size filter than, than Patrick was using. But then uh, we've got the grainier part of it below, the finer grain texture piece of this. 
by splitting this. So what we're doing is uh, splitting the image into two pieces, right, by spatial scale. And instead of two pieces, we can do this repeatedly, right? So we can, once we've got the 10 pixel residuals here, the lower image, we can filter that again, maybe with eight or nine pixels and so on. And so we can extract out um, a series of these. And so that's exactly what we do. And so what you're seeing here are plots of the RMS amplitude, so the same measure that Patrick used, but now we're, instead of splitting it into two groupings, right, kind of large scale and small scale, we're splitting it into, uh, what do I got here, about 18 or 19 different categories. And the, the number on the bottom is essentially the filter size, right? So the filter size, we go from one to 10, and then I start moving in steps of about five, and you can keep going up to whatever pixel size you want to here. Um, but what you do see is, is that uh, for, these are average spectra for a couple, or I guess these are actually just example spectra um, for some of these. You can see the differences pretty clearly in the spectra, right? Um, you can see differences, particularly the Fitzroll has got uh, at about a nine pixel scale, there's quite a bit of particulates at, at nine, um, but not a lot anywhere else. And then in Eurashall, we see quite a bit at, at very small sizes down at the zero and one size. Uh, zero just means it passes below a one element filter. Okay, so it's not really zero. Um, and the lac all has got somewhere in between. So we can immediately see that we've got differences in the different surfaces by looking at these kinds of spectra and it, it pops out pretty quickly. So if we can do things like this, right? If we can obtain a roughness spectra from a surface, what do we do with it? What can we ask about, about this measure, right? Because now we have a a way of quantifying what that surface is like that allow us to distinguish between uh, different types of lacquer or different types of surface treatment maybe. So how reliable is it? If we measure the same specimen over and over, do we get the same answer every time? Uh, how variable are repeated measurements? So if you, if you do this over and over, what do you see? Our surface is homogeneous. So do we get the same roughness measurements on all spots on a given surface or is this gonna change? That's one of the other questions because then, you know, if, if we get the same measurement essentially anywhere, then it's a great identifier. You just pick up the art object, you have Patrick scan it and off to the races we go. How different are these different lacquers of finishing techniques? How well can we actually uh, distinguish among them? Can we classify lacquer types? Can you classify types of surface preparation? So these are again, um, some of the surfaces of uh, Urashal, Lacol, and Thitzol. And just looking at them, you can sort of see some differences in the texture. So try not to look at the waviness aspect of it. Try to focus on the texture. And you can sort of see that these look a little different, right? There's something going on there. The first thing I did with this um, is PCA. This is uh, principal component analysis. Uh, this dates back to Fisher in the 1920s who invented this thing. But this is a way of producing an ordination, right? It's, a, it's now called, thought of as an unsupervised learning where we're just looking for patterns, right? We're finding these descriptors in the data that show us patterns of variation in the data without using any labeling, okay? So this is an unlabeled method. It's an unsupervised learning. It's just looking for grouping or patterns in the data. This is what the data processing path looks like for the PCA I'm gonna show in a minute. We had the raw data. We passed it in, we removed the tilt. We did this K nearest neighbors imputation of missing points in the data. We then filtered that, we passed it through that Gaussian filter bank. So we now have a roughness spectra. So we've taken that 984 by 984 image and we've reduced it down to, I think in this case, about a dozen uh, spectral frequencies, right? So spatial frequencies across that roughness spectra. And then we fed that into a PCA to see what the variability among specimens looked like. So way of summarizing many, many specimens. And this is what we see, we get uh, this is the first and second PC axis for this particular data set. Um, I won't talk about what, well, we'll talk about what that means in a moment, but what we can clearly see is we've got grouping um, of the different types of lacquer surfaces in this PCA. So we've got these kind of bands that move uh, diagonally upward from lower left to upper right. And there's a segregation here. The, these are specimen number and location abbreviations. So the U something something means uh, Eurashall in particular samples, lacol and thiosol. So, this is, again, this is a, 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 uh, an unsupervised learning method, right? So it's just showing us patterns of variation. And what we do see here is clumping, right? We see very distinct grouping or segregation of these specimens. So when I see this in a PCA, I'm always really excited because that means if I try to classify in this, it's gonna work really well because the pattern is appearing without any uh, labeling, right? So there's no, again, this is one of, there, there are other methods of unsupervised learning. This is one I've been using for uh, 20 years or something. Uh, and so this is my go-to for it. And it worked really nicely in this case. So what are the PCA axis telling us? Well, when you look at the loadings on a PCA, you can see what's important. 
And so um, if you look at, at the loadings for PC1, it's showing a positive loading, meaning that um, scale nine would increase the score and scale one would reduce it or the remnant on scale zero. So this PCA1 is a contrast between about a nine pixel scale roughness and the residual down near basically a one pixel point. So it's a contrast in roughness at different scales in the material. And the loadings on PCA2, um, it's got basically uh, sizes 0, 1, 2, 3, and 9 being important. Those are the, the sort of dominant um, scales of roughness in this material. So this is really a measure in, in, on PCA2 of overall roughness. So PCA2 is overall roughness. Uh, PCA1 is a contrast between uh, a very small scale roughness and a scale at about nine pixels. So there's a contrast going on here. So if we go back and look at this, um, that would tell us that as we move up this axis too, the surfaces are overall getting rougher. And as we move from left to right, that's that contrast between pixel size nine and about pixel size zero. A few days ago, Patrick um, got me uh, some of the treated material that he had, some of the aged material um, in, in LACOL. So we just have a few samples in LACOL of aged areas. Um, and so I dropped these again, ran the whole process and dropped them into the PCA. So the, the kind of different colored uh, images we have here, the pink, brown, and some of the light greens are aged versions of LACOL. And so when you look at them, they are plotting in with the other LACOL specimens. So it's still retaining, despite the fact that they're being aged and degrading, they're retaining kind of a LACOL-like characteristic to them. Um, but there's some interesting things. For example, it looks like the LACOL at, at areas three and four, which were the least aged, remember Patrick had that, that ordering, um, they are actually a little farther away than the more aged structures. So initially, so in other words, the initial aging is moving them away from the group, and then they kind of work their way back. Um, and that initially seemed a little bit strange as the cracks develop. But then if you go back and look at those pictures that, that Patrick had, it does look like in the initial stages of aging, the kind of localized roughness actually increased a little bit. And then when the cracks appear, that local roughness kind of fades a little bit. So there's something very interesting going on here. And we're very early in looking at this data, so I don't think we understand this at this point, but there's some interesting stuff going on here. Um, the important thing for me was we did see some impact here of aging. Age did shift the position of the points, but uh, we didn't destroy the fact that we could still, you know, group this with the lack hole. Okay, um, so I'm just going to skip through this, but we are definitely seeing some effects here. We're we'll able to see the impact of aging. We're we'll able to segregate uh, different groups of lacquers. So I also ran this through a random forest classifier. Again, random forest is one of those things that I use because it's very easy and very quick. Um, and so it's kind of a, I don't know, one quick way of, of running through these things. There are a lot of problems with classification trees, but nonetheless. Um, so in the random forest classifier, here's what the, the process looked like. Again, we're taking that raw data, removing the tilt, filter it, create the roughness spectra. Uh, we then take that data and randomly split it into a test set and a training set. Um, and then we use the training set to build the random forest classifier, use the test set to predict, to look and see what the predictive quality of it is, um, and, and then move onward. This is a validation uh, process here. So I've called it a test set. That's probably not really correct. Uh, it's better to call this a validation set because we are repeatedly running this, right? We don't have that much data. So we're holding out a few samples at a time and then looking at the performance. So it's really truly a cross validation, not really a training set. You should probably change that, call it validation. Um, we only have 41 surface measurements available to us. So we're using about five specimens at a time as the validation set. Um, but uh, this is what our confusion matrix looked like. We got a, we were up around 99% on cross validation. So on you know on new data sets we're not going to hit that right. This is cross validation. It's not going to be quite as stringent as a test set, but nonetheless um, we're only making a few mistakes on this. So um, that's pretty encouraging out of the random forest. It's not I guess that's not terribly surprising when you look back at the PCA because the PCA without any training right actually managed to split this stuff up in kind of the natural patterns in the data. So that was sort of nice. So that's what an initial pass um, looked like with you know, a reasonable classifier uh, based on this feature engineering roughness spectra. So the other thing, and again, I, there's some performance measures here. Uh, we're just gonna skip that. The, the, the next step we could look at here is to look at this 
as an image, right? And just go ahead and try and classify this using a neural net classifier, using a convolutional network. If you've heard of those, it's based on the types of structure we see in human or mammal uh, vision systems. So one of the issues here is we only have about 41 specimens. And so that's really gonna be difficult to train a machine learning tool with that few specimens. So what I did was break up the data into n by n subsets of the image. So we're randomly taking out a chunk that is n pixels by n pixels at random from each from each image. And I was using typically like 50 to 75, uh, 50 by 50 or 75 by 75 subsections of the image. Again, if, um, if that texture is fairly homogeneous across the surface, if we're seeing the same thing everywhere, a 50 by 50 or 75 by 75 image should have a lot of the information about texture um, that's embodied throughout the whole system. So, um, and the advantage of that obviously is that I can get a lot of more or less independent measurements um, of this by subsampling that. Uh, so the process for the convolutional neural network looks like this. We again, take the raw data, remove the tilt, impute the not of numbers. And then we use a, a, a method within TensorFlow called a generator. And you see these in the training of convolutional neural networks. You'll often use an image generator that'll take images and introduce mild distortions in an image, right? If you, if you take a picture of a dog and you rotate it a little bit or you rescale it a little bit, or if you, even if you skew it or stretch it a little bit, you still got a dog in the picture. And so one tactic you can use in something like TensorFlow is to build a generator that takes your images and alters them a little bit and then feeds them into the training flow. Here, I'm not actually altering the images. I'm just taking that 984 by 984 images and I'm cutting little snippets out of them, right? So I'm randomly picking images, randomly subsectioning these things, and that's all being handled in a generator. The generator develops the batch, which is then fed into um, the convolutional neural network training system. So there's a, a, a piece of code in there that does this randomization for me and takes care of that during the training process, makes it nice and easy to, to work for. So what we've got here is batches for tests or cross-validation. Again, it's really cross-validation. We haven't held that out entirely as, well as, as we might want to. The data sizes are just so small. Uh, and then we generate these training batches. So the training batch with the target on it, so we're now using you know labeled target here for the local type, uh, it's being used to train this convolutional neural network with a classifier on it. Um, the train classifier then predicts the lacquer type. We can feed in cross-validation batches and look at how well it's doing. And then we can compare this in, in a cross-validation framework. If we had more data, we could do um, a straight up test set on this as well. Maybe there's some other ways to think about how to do that. That might be another good project to think about here is how to improve this a bit. This was all built, this, this was built in TensorFlow. Um, so using Python and Keras API, basic generators created. So that was a programming task and there was to build that. Um, with the three lacquer types, we're again above about 99% accuracy in cross validation, not in a test set, but, but very high again. This was using 50 by 50 subsamples. So 50 by 50 piece images of this was enough to get really high grade classification. So that was pretty cool. Um, the classifier was using just three convolutional layers, so not a really deep classifier here. It had one layer, additional layer for classification and an output layer. So this was a five layer neural network, not a really big one. Um, 50 by 50 input data with a single channel. Um, again, this was a cross validation process rather than a true test process. So what can we do with this in, in terms of further methods? Um, I didn't, and I haven't had time to look at, at the age data yet. It'll be interesting to see what the classifier did to those aged versions of the LACOL data, see how well it does at identifying those, but we'll get there. What can we do with this? Um, as you saw, Patrick really had a lot more data there available. Um, so there's a lot there. There are different types of artwork we could think about. So there's a whole bunch of different applications of this basic technology um, to think about other types of surface measurements. Um, what else could we do with this? Under the, could we look at other methods of feature engineering? That might be worth looking at other approaches um, to characterizing the surface and extracting features from it. Um, again, you could go back and do something a little better in terms of that classifier, look at a gradient boost or something, uh, do some better, better test validation on this using true test sets. Uh, with the convolutional methods, this is very much untuned. I just built this thing, fired it up and ran it, and I'm at 99%. So given the data set, there isn't much point right at the moment in thinking about that. But uh, you know, how, what is the optimal sub-imaging size? Can we figure out how to get a, get a good test set out of this thing without using you know, all of our data to do that? Um, and then there was no optimization of this network topology or the operation of the network at all. I just popped one together first go and it worked. So 
Um, quite a bit left there in terms of work or experimentation. So I think I've left a little time for questions even, so I'll stop. Thanks so much, Dave and Patrick. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have uh, one question, I, I believe probably for Patrick. Uh, Steve is asking, the aging process uses light. What is the light source? Yeah, hi, Steve. Uh, <clears throat> basically, what, we, what was done at the Getty was to use a weatherometer. Uh, it was an Atlas CI4000 weatherometer, and they used a xenon arc lamp. Uh, 0.5 watts per meter squared at 340 nanometers, and they used a borosilicate uh, filter. So that, that way you, in a sense, get more natural light, get rid of that 340 to 390, 400 nanometer UV section. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I used to work at companies that uh, tried to simulate an aging process. They would do temperature cycling and so forth to a material to try to age it. And then it would study uh, the propagation of cracks in the material. And one of the things that we found was that the cracks would propagate at a greater rate from a corner on an object from say, than from say more of an interior area within the 2D surface. You know, like if we had like a square that we were evaluating that was like a substrate and we'd see the, the corner voids propagate quicker. Uh, and I just thought it was interesting to learn more about your process. Yeah, it was inter it's interesting that Thank it you. happened to you at a corner. Uh, it seems like, did you, find any, did you find any pits or any wells where things radiated? Yeah, what would happen is if there was any initial damage, they were bonding a material with solder or say with um, epoxy. And there was initially some void content because we would evaluate it with a sauna scan. We'd use ultrasonic microscope, we'd image it and we'd see some voids. And uh, any void that was from a corner already, once we had built it, you know, an imperfection in a process maybe, then you'd see that void propagate quicker as we temperature cycled it versus a void that was maybe in the center of the object or in the center. This was important to us because we want to have no voids, you know. It was, yeah. it was an interesting thing to see. Also, once the voids got over a certain size, they propagated even faster. They accelerated. Interesting. Thanks. Interesting. But thank you for helping me out with that information. Well, Steve, that seems yeah, like it was fun. Project could be a good fit for you. And uh, any, anyways, let's continue. Uh, well, I, I love, I love this. Yeah. I love the presentation. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, Erica is asking. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation, and she was curious about what brought you both to this field. So how do we get started? I'm trying to remember how we, exactly how we got connected. How do we, how do we connect up? Did you contact me? Is that how this worked? I'm trying to remember. Uh, yes. As a matter okay. of fact, um, I, I've been working with surfaces for a long time, you know, trying to figure out a way to apply them. Uh, and the, I, I always felt the mechanical engineering approach was good. I mean, you got some information, but I felt there was always more there. And um, David and I have a friend in common, Peter Bush, okay. who runs the uh, electromicroscopy facility at uh, UB South Campus. <clears throat> and I've known Peter for, gosh, you know, 15 years, roughly, since I came back to the States. And in conversation with him, I was saying, look, I'm doing this. And I'm, you know, working at this, doing that, the other. He tells me about the bite marks he's been doing. <clears throat> and he said, well, I was working with this physicist. And he said, maybe you'd want to contact him. And that's how our paths uh, converged because I then contacted Dave. We met, I told him what I was playing with and he said, oh, sounds like a nice little sandbox. And this is where we are now. I think maybe three, three and a half, maybe even four years later. Yeah. So I got connected with, with Peter Bush and Mary Bush, who's his, who's a, his wife and a dentist at, at the UB uh, Dental School. Peter Bush runs a surface metrology, a measurement lab that serves a dental school, but also other uh, units at UB and they do consulting work. Um, but I got in touch with him after working with geologists at UB, right? And some of the geologists were imaging specimen in Peter Bush's lab. So just all these long chains of connections um, between people because um, often, often how things work. Um, yeah. I started out as, as I said, as a physicist. Um, so the idea of spectral analysis is very kind of natural in physics. And so I was very aware of those types of techniques. So here we're using a spatial um, distribution patterns of roughness, but you know it's a spectral pattern nonetheless. Um, and then you know um, 
as I learn more tools, I start saying, oh, I bet we could do that with it. You know, this, this tool would be something we can use to uh, address this problem. So, so some of that came from some of the convolutional network things. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, another uh, question from Paul. Uh, he, he mentions uh, about the BMW at the beginning of the presentation. He's wondering if this uh, help would cre help create stealth coating for those cars. <laughs> I don't think so. I just liked it because it actually mimicked the floor. Um, if you if you remember, it, you know it, the the light panels were squarish. There was black and white tiling on the floor. It just kind of seemed to kind of blend in. That's all highly reflective surface. Uh, nothing nothing to do. I'm not supporting BMW. It just happened to be the the car that was available on on the website that I was looking at. Thanks, thanks, Patrick. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, to emphasize to students the, um, the combination of, of data science alongside with mathematics, physics, and, uh, and art conservation and all the material science is, I, I think it's relatively new. Are, are you familiar if, if these techniques have been used? Like, I mean, deep, you know, deep learning, neural networks, machine learning, uh, how 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 new is this? You think in your field? There are people working with surface metrology. There's a, a handful of us in the shall we say science and cultural heritage and art world. Uh, I do know that there's quite a few physicists uh, look working with at looking at and working with surfaces with atomic force microscopy, and the advantage there is that they can actually start looking at. Uh, the resolution of the X, Y, and Z directions are going to be comparable, as opposed to having Z being much higher resolution than the lateral. That's where the confocal microscope, which is what Dominique was asking, we used confocal microscopy, we're doing area scans or <laughs> capturing areas as a whole, which is the next step above from a profilometer. But anyway, so there are these, there's the physicists, you know, physical chemists working in this area, looking at surfaces as a way <clears throat> to see the chemical reactivity and the physical reactivity of a surface. And they're able to extract the actual physical features from these. And that's in an area where I think we're looking at these patterns with what Dave has been doing. And we, the idea is, well, gosh, now we need to figure out, well, what's the physical reality describing this and how do we explain it and how do we you know extract it from those images that we have <clears throat> so that's in a sense yes there are some people working it it's very limited uh, <clears throat> there is an interest in it the our colleagues at the getty we were also talking about well geez what's the chemical reactivity what's the chemistry and how does that relate to the actual surface and the physics of the surface and is there a way to link that so there's interest along those lines but it's a small group uh, of us working in that area uh, and i really look to a lot of other fields outside of cultural heritage science or conservation science to be able to catch ideas of what other people are doing that could in a sense help in the work that we do thanks um, one one of the things that, that I think is exciting that we haven't looked at yet is that you know once you have a convolutional network built that can distinguish right among these different types of lacquer, um, you can also run a gradient ascent and figure out what uh, input image gives you maximal classification on the classifier. And so what that means is you can find out what it's looking at. So you can find an image of what types of features on the surface are being picked up. So you so. Convolutional neural networks have that property. Since the input is an image, you can interpret it pretty easily, right? Um, by by running the process backwards and looking to see what is the maximal excitation of a given output, and so that you could start to tie. Um, if you can build detectability for a particular feature, you can run it backwards and see what it's actually picking up. So there's some very exciting things there. Um, that's going to take a bit of work, but uh, there's some exciting things coming back to tie, uh, as Patrick said, to some physical processes. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it really sounds very exciting and there is a lot of opportunities there. And I, I wanted to emphasize, I, I am an optimist in the sense that I think that the, what data science has done is to allow people with, without really you know, many years of experience in mathematics and physics to be able to do this. I think that to, to run a, uh, a neural network or to do some of the PCA 
um, you, you can use some packages that already you know come together in Python. Or if you look in the Jake Banter Platt book or some of the CC tutorials online. So would you agree, Dave, that that what 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 you know what is being done with some guidance, students with relatively you know little math background can do it, or you think that that you need a lot of math to to be able to to get it? There's a there's a lot here. There's quite a bit that could be done um, with relatively um, relatively you know limited mathematical background. Um, it, it, the programming was in either R or Python. I, I've used both. Different parts of this were done in different in different tool sets, but they're readily available tool sets. Um, these are not you know there's nothing terrible here about this. And again, um, you know even the more demanding things like trying to work backwards and figure out what you know what what that excitation image the, the idea I talked about a minute ago. This is a fairly standard technique, you know. So it's a matter of doing the reading and understanding how it works and getting it implemented and running it. Um, so these things are very approachable. Um, yeah, somebody asked if there's a course or mini course on it. Um, I don't know if we're. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that one. This is using, this is really pretty much standard um, Python based tactics in terms of. Yeah, like I can mention basically that for the machine learning part, for the PCA and the, the, the you know, all the KNN stuff, this is covered in any basic machine learning course that we covered in our course, Canisius covers it in their courses. And for the uh, deep learning, there is uh, the one I like is uh, Google's crash course on machine learning that is exclusively done on, on deep learning. So they have, you know, the TensorFlows and Keras and everything is there. Um, so it, it, it is not hard to catch up. And I, I know a lot of people that really, they, they have a degree in, in something and they've moved into data science and they basically got everything from tutorials and books that are available. It's, there's a ton of things out there. And uh, the, the other thing is, I, I think that, I don't know if you may agree with me, uh, uh, Dave and Patrick, that, that the, the language that science has used has created a lot of silos. So if you're talking about doing, you know, uh, double integrals and, and you're talking about doing, you know, Fourier analysis and so on, it sounds really more complicated than, than it seems. And it is, it, I agree that it does take a couple of years if you want to learn everything about it. But... To teach somebody what a derivative is or what a double integral is in a simple example, it takes just, you know, a day. I mean, it's not really, it's just the integral is just area. A double integral is volume and the derivative is just how something changes with respect to time. So I've, I've always thought that, you know, mathematics could have a broader audience. And, and in many places in the world, it does. In the United States, a little bit less. People is a little bit more react against it. But... Uh, I, I, I mean, I honestly think that anybody who wants to do data science uh, should not be scared of doing it because of the, the possible mathematics that is behind it. I mean, you, you learn as you go, and also you learn what you need. You don't have to learn everything. So I don't, I don't know if you agree with it, or what is your, your view on this, Dave? There's a, I think there, the, within data science, um, your data analytics, whatever you, want, whatever you want to call this field that's developing, there are a lot of different roles. Um, I think that's one thing I, that I really think about this, you know, and um, I'm pretty comfortable with a lot of mathematics. I mean, that's that's my world. Um, but there are skill sets that I need on jobs that I don't have. Right. And, and you have to find a team that assembles to meet that. So, you know, I think if you're interested in these types of areas, you know, it, it really is about teamwork. Um, and. Mathematics is not the only skill set that you need here, you know, on a job like this or really any data analytics job. Um, some graphical skills, right? Some understanding how to produce good quality graphics and how to explain things is, is a really critical part of the job. Um, handling the data, writing code is a critical part of the job. Um, talking about problems and thinking about other ways, you know, thinking what the analogies are, right? If you looked at, I sort of used some analogies here to think about how to address this data. Um, all those skills all matter, right? And so there's a lot of different places um, within kind of data analytics, data science, that whole world um, for people with different skill sets. And, you know, you, you need to appreciate your teammates' skills. That's one of the things I've learned doing this is try to understand what you're good at, what your partners are good at. Um, and, you know, if you have a team that's missing a skill that you really need, where do you find that, you know? So, um, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of range here. Yeah. And uh, uh, students, you have a fantastic opportunity to work in a top-notch team working on a really good problem. I hope you uh, give it a try. 
that we can take a few of you. And uh, thanks again for your presentation. It was really enjoyable. Uh, very, very good. Thanks so much.